तव कथात तप्त जीवन कविरेडीतम कलमशापम शरवणमंगल श्रीमदातद भुवि वनती भूरिराजना Your words are like nectar bringing life to scorched souls. They are praised by poets and remove all sin. They are auspicious to hear, wonderful and exalted. Those who spread these words throughout the world are truly giving souls. Welcome everyone to our class on the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. We are on the chapter Advice to Brahmos, page 200, and the date is Sunday, April 8th, 1883. It was Sunday morning. The master, looking like a boy, was seated in his room, and near him was another boy, his beloved disciple Rakhal. M entered and saluted the master. Ramlal also was in the room, and Kishori. Kishori is probably M's younger brother. I think there was a second Kishori, but uh, M never mentions the fact that he's his brother. Throughout the entire <laughs> Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, he's very careful not to bring in any any family issues. When family issues come up, he doesn't even he'll use a, a second nickname, not the M something else, uh, Mani Mohini or something like that. Uh, so Ram Lal was also in the room, and Kishori, Mani Lal Malik, and several other devotees gathered by and by. Mani Lal Malik, a businessman, had recently been to Benares, where he owned a bungalow. Master, so you have been to Benares? Did you see any holy men there, Mani Lal? Yes, sir. I paid my respects to Trilanga Swami, Bhaskarananda, and others. Trilanga Swami and Bhaskarananda Swami were the two f- very famous, well-known uh, sadhus in Benares that almost everybody went to see, and uh, this. Trilanga Swami, he was very well known in other traditions also. I read some things about him years ago, uh, about he was supposed to have lived three hundred years. All sorts of things. Nobody knew too much about him. Probably they say that his name was really Trilanga, that he was a Telugu, Telugu uh, man who had come up to, to the north. Uh, somehow it became this Trilanga. Which uh, sounds like a good Sanskrit word, but I'm not sure that it <laughs> means anything actually in Sanskrit. So probably he was a Telugu man, but he didn't speak. Most of the time he remained silent. Uh, Holy Mother also met him, huh? and I, maybe Bhaskar. Many of, many of those who went, uh, they both stayed in different places, uh, right on the Ganga, diff- the different bathing ghats. In uh, Benares, there are all sorts of places where sadhus can stay. It's really a city for sadhus, and very easy for them to to get the, their their food and lodging and everything. People would have uh, garden houses and things, and they would simply let a sadhu come and live in the, in the garden area or garden house or something, uh, without bothering them uh, at all. It'd be very convenient for them. <laughs> Master, tell us something about them. Mani Lal. Trilanga Swami is living in the same temple where he lived before, on the Mani Karnika Ghat, near the Beni Madhav Minaret. Mani Karnika Ghat is, of course, the f- famous cremation ground. And, uh, they say for I don't know how many centuries that there's never a moment when there's not a body being burned. But there'll be three or four at a time. So if one finishes, there'll be another one going on. My first trip to India, huh? I went. Uh, I went to Benares. I stayed in a very nice place. There was a, a Burmese Buddhist vihar that uh, I could stay just just as a as a guest. They had their their own guest house there, so I stayed there. And I used to walk to the Ganga uh, every day and uh, take my bath there and and uh, uh, just in, enjoy the different places there and. Uh, One night, I decided to spend the, the, the night, whole night at the Mani Karnika Ghat, watching the bodies burn. <laughs> it sounds a little bit odd, but uh, it was a very inspiring experience, and it gives great dispassion. This is why uh, many sadhus will meditate in a cremation ground. And you really get this feeling that this this body is not the person. And how temporary life is, and how one after another bodies are being burnt. 
So he had his place there. People say he was formerly in a more exalted spiritual state. He could perform many miracles. Now he has lost much of that power. Master, that is the criticism of worldly people. Manilal. Trailanga Swami keeps a strict vow of silence. Unlike him, Bhaskarananda is friendly with all. Master, did you have any conversation with Bhaskarananda? Manilal. Yes, sir. We had a long talk. Among other things, we discussed the problem of good and evil. He said to me, don't follow the path of evil. Give up sinful thoughts. That is how God wants us to act. Perform only those duties that are virtuous. Very simple. Very simple type of uh, instruction. Master, yes, that is also a path meant for worldly-minded people. Probably he knew that this Manilal was also a worldly-minded person, even though he's a devotee. But uh, we can assume that this Bhaskaranda Swami was a, a man of great renunciation and uh, had done a lot of tapasya spiritual practice. <laughs> but anyhow, this is the advice that he gave to him. <clears throat> so he says, that, yes, that is also a path meant for worldly-minded people. But those whose spiritual consciousness has been awakened, who have realized that God alone is real and all else illusory, cherish a different ideal. They are aware that God alone is the doer and others are his instruments. Those whose spiritual consciousness has been awakened never make a false step. This was uh, one of the special teaching to Sri Ramakrishna, he would give the illustration of, uh, of a musician or a dancer. That uh, we see these, these great artists who, whatever they do, it'll, it'll be beautiful. I, I always remember our Swami Taratmanandi. He is the, the artist who did so many of the paintings in our center. He was a fantastic artist. And I used to marvel at him because uh, sometimes he would have to do a little sketch or I would, I would ask him, he'd give me a project to do and, and he would make a little drawing. Even making a little square or rectangle, it looked like a work of art. Huh? It looked like Picasso had sketched something, you know, he did a few things like that on the, an napkin or something. Uh, it, was, it was almost impossible for him to do something that didn't look artistic. So this is what Takwa is saying, because we read that uh, God realized soul is beyond good and evil. They can do whatever they want and nothing will touch them. And many sadhus will say that. They can even do uh, unethical things, uh, immoral types of things, and say, uh, these things don't touch me. I mean, I've, I've realized God. Now, Taka will say that, yes, these things won't touch them, but if they've really realized God, uh, it won't be in their nature to do it. Not that they couldn't do anything uh, with the feeling that I'm not the doer and they wouldn't get the karma for it, but it's impossible. The mind has been changed. They're, they're full of, of sattva at that point. So uh, this is what it means that, that they won't take a false step, this expert dancer. They won't miss a beat. Everything will be in, in tune with nature, in harmony. Uh, even by accident, they won't uh, do something wrong. So those whose spiritual consciousness has been awakened never make a false step. They do not have to reason in order to shun evil. They are so full of love of God that what, whatever action they undertake is a good action. And everything is for the welfare of others. Whatever they do is to set an example for others and is for the benefit of others. They are fully conscious that they are not the doers of their actions but mere servants of God. They always feel, I am the machine and he is the operator. I do as he does through me. I speak as he speaks through me. I move as he moves me. Now, this is something that uh, Takwar talks about all of the time. Uh, there are different songs, Kamala Kanta songs, famous Ram Prasad song, where uh, we, we read that uh, this is one type of spiritual attitude, but it's more than a spiritual attitude. This is actually the, the result of realization. And uh, we, we have to make sure that uh, if we do it as a spiritual attitude, we understand that uh, it requires us to eliminate all selfish motive from everything. 
if we want to be able to say that uh, I do as God makes me do, then I have to make sure that this ego isn't intruding. This was the, the big dilemma that Girish Ghosh faced. He was given an instruction like this, give the Lord your power of attorney. Uh, as a sadhana, which is different, as a sadhana, very few people can do it. It becomes a little bit hypocritical unless every moment we analyze the mind and is there some hidden motive, some selfishness behind it. Otherwise, to do whatever we want to do and then to say it's the will of God, it becomes a type of hypocrisy. And Tucker also says that. But he, he nevertheless will say that this is the highest ideal and those who have that highest type of realization, this is how they feel because uh, there's no I left. If there's no I left, then who is it who can be the doer of, of action? So for Takur, we see it manifest in two different ways. If he had a little bit of sense of I, then it was I do as mother makes me do. If even that disappears, then is the mother speaking through me? Either she's telling him what to say or she herself is speaking through him. Not much difference, but uh, we can see that one is an even higher level. We were reading this morning from the Gospel that Takwa says, sometimes I look within, I see two are there. I see Divine Mother is there and, and her child is there, the devotee, that means me. So some slight sense of, of distinction and, and the separation is there. Uh, in that case, then the devotee will say, I'll do whatever Mother wants me to do can have that type of attitude. But then Takwa says sometimes this I disappears completely and mother alone is there. Then who is there to even say I do as mother makes me do? Everything is the will of, of God. Or I do as the wind blows, this is how I, I act, like the dry leaf in the wind. This is the other attitude that just whatever past karma may be there uh, will, or whatever circumstances lead me to do one thing or another, I won't make any decisions. I won't do anything on my own. Uh, this is another uh, type of, of spiritual attitude. So it says, they always feel. Now he's talking about those whose spiritual consciousness has been awakened. Either God-realized souls or very uh, highly spiritual souls. They always feel, I am the machine and he is the operator. I do as he does through me. I speak as he speaks through me. I move as he moves me. This is an ideal that we can uh, appreciate and uh, we can uh, see the beauty of it. But in the beginning of spiritual life, it's better to take responsibility for our actions. Yes, I did it. If it was good, thank God. If it was bad, I'm sorry. I won't try to do it again. It's a safer type of attitude. Fully awakened souls are beyond virtue and vice. They realize that it is God who does everything. So now he's not simply saying those whose spiritual consciousness has been awakened, he's saying fully awakened souls. So it's raised to even a higher level. Beyond virtue and vice, they don't have to worry, am I doing something according to scripture? This is dharmic, this is adharmic, because automatically whatever they do is good. It's not that they can commit evil things and, and they won't be touched by it. The if we, if we want to make a slight distinction and we want to say that killing people in battle is evil uh, and that uh, Sri Krishna is telling Arjuna to do that, that uh, of course it's for the sake of dharma, but just for the sake of argument. Uh, no karma will cling to Sri Krishna because he knows he's not the agent of action, even though he knows he's an avatar also. But it has to be for the sake of dharma, something like that. Otherwise, uh, not out of a desire for worldly possession or anything else. <laughs> there was a monastery in a certain place. The monks residing there went out daily to beg their food. One day a monk, while out for his alms, saw a landlord beating a man mercilessly. The compassionate monk stepped in and asked the landlord to stop. But the landlord was filled with anger and turned his wrath against the innocent monk. He beat the monk till he fell unconscious on the ground. Someone reported the matter to the monastery. The monks ran to the spot and found their brother lying there. Four or five of them carried him back and laid him on a bed. He was still unconscious, 
The other monks sat around him, sat at heart. Some were fanning him. Finally, some had suggested that he should be given a little milk to drink. When it was poured into his mouth, he regained consciousness. He opened his eyes and looked around. One of the monks said, Let us see whether he is fully conscious and can recognize us. Shouting into his ear, he said, Revered sir, who is giving you milk? Brother, replied the holy man in a low voice, he who beat me is now giving me milk. That means he sees the same self in, in all beings, makes no distinction between a good person and a bad person, that the same divine presence is within all. Uh, so this was uh, an example. We have, we have examples. <laughs> There's one story of one, one sadhu, a well-known story, it was at the time of what they called a mutiny. It was actually a re rebellion, not really a, a mutiny, but uh, as, as he was dying, uh, he said, Tatwamasi, that word, that, something like that. So uh, this is a sign of, of the highest knowledge. First of all, not, not just seeing the self in all, but absolutely free from, from anger. Huh? We, we would naturally expect that somebody beat him so badly, beat him unconscious, that he would have some anger, some resentment, some hatred towards him. But one does not attain such a state of mind without the realization of God. So we, we have to understand some spiritual attitudes and spiritual moods come after God realization. Some are used in order to realize God. Some can be used to realize God, but we have to understand that uh, uh, we're superimposing uh, an attitude. Arup Koran, Thakur uses that, that expression, that uh, we're trying to imagine that we're that type of person. We're trying to feel, how would this great sadhu react? Somebody strikes me, and uh, I say, I'm not angry. I may be angry inside, uh, but trying to tell myself so that I really won't be angry, to, to teach myself that. We adopt that type of uh, spiritual attitude. This can also be done. But we have to realize that uh, it becomes real and spontaneous after God realization, different. The same thing with what we call the ripe ego. This ripe ego is used at the time of sadhana, that we, we adopt it, we take it on, we may, let that be our persona. I may not feel it 100%, but I try to keep telling myself <laughs> that uh, I can't claim credit for anything because I'm the servant of God. That I have to feel that whatever I'm doing is not for my sake, but for the Master. And every time we fail and do something selfishly, we have to remind ourselves. So this is a mood, attitude that we adopt, Dasya Bhava or any other, other Bhava, for the sake of spiritual realization of sadhana. After Having the highest realization, when the mind comes back down, then we also live in the world with uh, some type of spiritual attitude and relationship. And that's a different type of dasami, Taku says, that I am the servant of God or the child of God. That's the, something that we really feel to be true and which we need in order to live in the world. It's not in order to take us higher again. It's, it's in order to keep the mind on a lower level. Because once anyone experiences that, that highest type of, of samadhi, the pull is so great that most people can't resist it. The very few can come down. This is why Thakur is constantly trying to keep his mind on a lower plane. So my Brahmananda, people would wonder why he's always laughing and joking with kids and, and fishing and all of that. He had to try to keep his mind down. He was very similar to Sri Ramakrishna in, in that way. Manilal. Sir, what you have just said applies to a man of a very lofty spiritual state. I talked on such topics in a general way with the Bhaskarananda. So he's saying, don't think that the Bhaskarananda simply said, uh, avoid evil, lead a good life, and didn't give anything uh, any more uh, helpful in spiritual life, anything more sophisticated or, or subtle, that he must have said other things also. Master, does he live in a house? Manilal, yes, sir, he lives with the devotee. Master, how old is he? Manilal, about 55. Master, did you talk about anything else? Manilal, 
I asked him how to cultivate bhakti. He said, chant the name of God, repeat the name of Rama. Now, the very simple thing. Either, either he is also a very simple childlike nature, or he knows he can't give anything. He can't tell his money, Lal, you, you do japa 10,000 times a day. That it won't help him. Anyhow, Thakur likes it. And the Master says, that is very good. The worship was over in the temples, and the bells rang for the food offerings in the shrines. As it was a summer noon, the sun was very hot. The flood tide began in the Ganges, and a breeze came up from the south. Sri Ramakrishna was resting in his room after his meal. The people of Boshiahat, Rakhal's birthplace, had been suffering from a severe drought during the summer months. We know his birthplace is Shikra Kulingram, which I think is probably, this is, uh, Boshirhat maybe is the larger area, and Shikra is a, is a smaller uh, village area. Our Swami Sarvadevarandaji was there for many years and was uh, so beloved that when he left, when he was transferred to uh, California, to Hollywood, and, and had to leave there, that literally the devotees were weeping. And uh, I had the great fortune of, uh, of going to the Shikra Kuningram, the, the, the birthplace of Rakhal, which is now one of our centers, and uh, going there with Swami Sarvadevanandaji and witnessing <laughs> how after so many years uh, that so many people still remember him. And he started uh, all different types of uh, relief work and uh, small orphanage and, and these different village uh, uh, schools in the Sundarbon area, a uh, very poor area with uh, some tribal people and others, and uh, very hard to get to. We had to go by boat to some of the places, remote uh, village areas, and uh, doing fantastic work there. There's all these dedicated volunteer teachers and uh, all these, these children, especially girls, who probably no one in their family had ever gone to school before. I'm, I'm quite sure. Uh, I, even many of the boys, uh, at a young age, they're poor people. They have to go out and even the children have to work. So it was very nice to, to see, see that area. It's very beautiful. beautiful. You want to see beautiful village areas huh, of Bengal, go to the Shundabon area. We went on the same trip to a place called uh, Shomshar. <laughs> this is the birthplace of Swami Bhuteshananda Maharaj. That was really a gorgeous village. This, uh, I love the villages of India. They're, they're so quiet and serene, and the people are so simple. It's a very nice experience. Master to Manila. Rakhal says that the people in his native village have been suffering seriously from a scarcity of water. Why don't you build a reservoir there? This was something that was a very standard thing. People with money, uh, they would build a road, in villages that didn't have roads, or they would build, uh, dig a reservoir for areas where they had trouble with, with the drought, or they would uh, have a feeding place for monks, or a place where they could stay. These were all very standard things that wealthy people would do in order to get punya. To get, we read about it even in the Upanishads. And uh, so Thakur is recommending that for him. For one thing, he's a wealthy man, there's money lal, and it'll be good for him to do that type of work. And uh, on the other hand, there's a need for it. We, we forget how, how compassionate Thakur was because uh, uh, very often he's telling people, don't get too involved in charity work, this and that. Realize God first. And, but uh, his, he had a very tender heart. And uh, whenever he, he heard of anything like that, people suffering from drought, that he would try to do, if, if he could easily get to have something done, he would try to do it. So, he says, why don't you build a reservoir there? That will do the people good. Smiling, you have much, so much money, what will you do with all your wealth? But they say the tellies are very calculating. The telly is, the, uh, is a certain caste in India, the people who make oil. So uh, if, you, if you go to India, you'll see sometimes, especially Bengal, all these seeds 
mustard seeds, other types of seeds drying out in the sun, and then they'll collect them later and they'll grind them and they'll make oil and they'll sell them and they can become pretty wealthy uh, through all of this. And they have a reputation for being a little miserly. So Takur is, is poking him a little bit. We don't know why exactly, but it's an interesting uh, incident that takes place here. But they tell me the tellies are very calculating, all laugh. So now he's a little embarrassed. Uh, the telly, it's also not a very high caste. Huh? They, uh, they'll be considered, uh, they may be wealthy, but they'll be a little rustic or they won't be considered very sophisticated people. And again, miserly. Manilai was truly a calculating man, though he suffered no lack of money. This is M speaking. In later years, he set up an endowment of 25,000 rupees for the maintenance of poor students. So who knows, if it wasn't this little poking, this uh, what Takwa said here, that uh, awakened this in him. You, uh, you know the story of uh, Rockefeller, huh? that uh, some people question whether it actually, actually took place or not, but it certainly sounds quite possible to me that uh, when Swamiji was in Chicago, there were many well-to-do people that came to see him because uh, they were the circles he was traveling in. They were the ones who would come to the lectures and things, the highly educated people, well-to-do people. And uh, it said that one day the Rockefeller came to meet Swamiji. They had some type of conversation or something. And uh, Swamiji said to him, you have so much money, why don't you do something to help people like that? He got offended. And then he left and he must have thought about it and he came back and he wrote a big check uh, I think that he was the, the founder of the University of Chicago. It may have been for that. Very big check. And he wanted to show Swamiji that he was going to give some money because he was so fabulously wealthy. And he said, Swamiji, are you going to thank me now for this? And Swamiji <laughs> hardly looked up, maybe barely looked up and said, it is for you to thank me. Huh? So this is for the money law to thank Takur that it's a great blessing and privilege to be able to serve others. Uh, they say, if you have money, then give money. If you don't, do japa. There's a holy mother like that, that expression. <laughs> Manilal was truly a calculator. Oh, sorry. Manilal made no answer to these words of the master about his caste characteristics. He stood a little bit in silence. Later on, in the course of conversation, <laughs> he remarked casually, Sir, you refer to a reservoir. You might as well have confined yourself to that suggestion. Why allude to the oil man caste and all that? Some of the devotees smiled to themselves. The master laughed. Presently, a few elderly members of the Brahma Samaj arrived. The room was full of devotees. Sri Ramakrishna was sitting on his bed, facing the north, he kept smiling and talked to the Brahmo devotees in a joyous mood. Most of the time he faces north. Huh? That's because more people can be sitting in the area uh, against the back wall facing the, the bed south that way. But I always remember that uh, when M went the very first time and he walked through the, the, the door from the inside of the courtyard, that Takwar was facing east as if waiting for him to come. So when he walked in, and Takwa could see him entering through the door. He kept smiling and talking to the Brahmo devotees in a joyous mood. Master, you talk glibly about prema. Prema uh, is a high state of love of God. This bhakti is devotion. Prema will be even something more. The real, real full uh, deep type of, of love that, that fills one, right? this, this divine type of love. So many songs are written about it and, and people talk about it, but it's a very rare thing. You talk glibly about prema, but is it such a commonplace thing? Now he's talking to the Brahmo members. I don't know why specifically, but 
Of course, there are others in the room as well. There are two characteristics of prema. First, it makes one forget the world. So intense is one's love of God that one becomes unconscious of other things. Forget the world. Uh, we can understand this two ways. One, that the world becomes something insignificant. The other is that even through this prema, one can achieve these states of bhava and ecstasy and, and samadhi even so that one is not even aware of anything else. He'll give examples. <laughs> Chaitanya had this ecstatic love. He took a, and this is a quote, many songs are written about this. He took a wood for the sacred grove of Vrindavan and the ocean for the dark waters of the Jamana. There were a couple of instances when uh, Chaitanya Deva was in Puri. Puri, uh, where he stayed, it was right by the, the ocean. And... Uh, Walking along the beach and seeing the waters of the ocean, he was reminded of the Jamana and thought of Sri Krishna. This is what's called Uddipana, and this is the, the characteristic that Thakur had in common with the Chaitanya Deva. Very, very similar. And of course, we read about it with uh, Radha also. Mm. And uh, his mind was so immersed with its idea that this is the Jamana and Sri Krishna would would graze cattle on the banks of the Jamana, that he entered into the water and practically drowned. And in one case, the fishermen had to fish him out of their nets. The way they throw out the net to catch the fish, they brought him back. And uh, one theory is that possibly this is how he died also, because the body was never found. We don't know exactly how he died. The very pious Vaishnavas believe that he merged in the image of Jagannath inside the temple. Uh, others, uh, this, uh, other theory is also there. Nobody knows exactly what happened, but we do know that he had that characteristic, that, that uh, <laughs> quality of association, that uh, uh, seeing something would trigger this divine thought in the mind, and then he would no longer see. He would no longer be seeing the ocean. He's seeing Jamana. Uh, that Radha was no longer seeing the peacock with the tail feathers up, she was seeing Sri Krishna himself because he kept a, a peacock in his, in his headdress or the dark rain cloud. Huh? Not seeing the dark rain cloud anymore, seeing Krishna. Second, one has no feeling of minus toward the body, which is so dear to a person. One wholly gets rid of the feeling that the body is the soul. So this comes through prema. These are the same things that will come through jnana also. So this is, this is where the path of, of love and the path of knowledge, path of devotion and knowledge, where they'll dovetail. We'll have to see the same types of uh, very positive spiritual uh, effects from the, these two different types of causes. There are certain signs of God realization. The man in whom longing for God manifests its glory is not far from attaining him. So we look for, for road signs, milestones, that these, the divine qualities will start to manifest. We read in, in Gita about this uh, Deva Sampad and the Asura Sampad, that this love and devotion and calmness and same-sidedness, all of these things are considered divine qualities that belong to God. We can say Brahman uh, makes no distinction. Brahman is equal, calm, the same everywhere. When we see those characteristics in the devotee, then we know that they're close to attaining. What are the glories of that longing? They are discrimination, dispassion, compassion for living beings, serving holy men, loving their company, chanting the names and glories of God, telling the truth and the like. This is all the Deva Sampad. These are the, the treasures of uh, this, this uh, very sattvic, uh, divine type of uh, personality that we can develop uh, when we lead a spiritual life. These are ways that we can recognize in other people also. We want to know how to, how to tell if someone is a real holy person or not that we have to see that they have this discrimination, dispassion, compassion for living beings, serving holy men, loving their company, chanting the names and glories of God, telling the truth and, and the like.
The state of a servant's house will tell you unmistakably whether his master has decided to visit it. First, the rubbish and jungle around the house are cleared up. Second, the soot and dirt are removed from the rooms. Third, the courtyard, floors, and other places are swept clean. Finally, the master himself sends various things to the house, such as a carpet, a hubba bubble for smoking, and the like. When you see these things arriving, you conclude that the master will very soon come. We read about this example as uh, one type of grace, and there, there's a very final ultimate grace that we all know. We, when we think of grace, we think that uh, some enlightenment comes, that uh, God reaches out and touches us, we have some direct experience. But this is the, the first type of grace. We read in Vivek Chudamani, uh, the three different types, huh? that even getting this human birth is due to the grace of God, having this longing for realization, the grace of God, finding a, a, a real spiritual teacher all through the grace of God. So Thakur gives this illustration that uh, in order for God to enter into our hearts, of course God is always there, but to manifest for us to realize that the heart has to first be purified. So if this grace is to come, this initial grace comes. So Thakur says that uh, there's a king and he, and he tells his ministers, I'd like to visit a home of one of the subjects in my kingdom, just to see how they're doing, how the ordinary people live, are they suffering too much, are they struggling, getting enough food, this and that. So they said, very good, and the king said, pick one family. So they pick one family, and the ministers go, and they see that uh, it needs to be cleaned up, that it's a little bit dirty, that there's no, uh, no furniture there, if the king actually comes, there's no place for him to sit. If they want to serve him tea, there's no nice tea set. So uh, they spend a little time there, getting their workers there, cleaning up, repairing things, uh, getting some nice furniture, everything, so that when the king comes, uh, he'll, he'll feel comfortable there, that everything will be prearranged. So that'll be the final grace. The first is that initial grace, and when we see that, we know that ultimately the, the, the king himself will come. So this is what Takwa says. When you see these things arriving, you conclude that the master will very soon come. When we see these divine qualities manifesting an individual, we can, we can have that faith that they're very close to a God realization. A devotee. Sir, should one first practice discrimination to attain self-control. Thakur always uh, gives us the easy way to do things. In order to control ourselves, if we just use the uh, st strength of the mind, the will of power, to discriminate and say, uh, this won't be helpful to me, even though I like it, so I should give it up, and then it'll be a bit of a struggle. But if there's a simple way to do it so that we drop things off, they, they leave us, that uh, rather than fight the desire for something, get something that's, that's more appealing to us, and then the desire for the other thing drops off. That was the way he generally liked to do things, to give us the easier way and more efficient way of doing it. So he says that is also a path it is called the path of vichara, reasoning. But the inner organs, there's a footnote, this referring to the, the mind and the intellect, is what we call the manasabuddhi, chitta, hankara. This, uh, uh, it really means the, all the functioning of the mind, the mind itself. The inner organs are brought under control naturally through the path of devotion as well. It is rather easily accomplished that way. Sense pleasures appear more and more tasteless as love for God grows. So this is why Thakur used to say, you, say, you want to leave the, the West, just start walking towards the East. Automatically you'll leave it behind. So if, uh, fix your mind on something higher. Re replace the desire for worldly things with a desire for God, which is a far more... <laughs> adorable object of, of our love and, and desire than anything in the world. Sense pleasures 
appear more and more tasteless as love for God grows? Can carnal pleasure attract a grief-stricken grief man and woman the day their child has died? Devotee, how can I develop love for God? It's a very good question because uh, what do we know of God? Huh? Even, even somebody that we know, an, another person, to develop love for them is not a simple thing unless they have the uh, personality, unless they feel attracted to us and we have uh, an intimate conversation with them. Uh, but we're talking about something so subtle and uh, what do we know about God? To, to say that, yes, oh, I love God. God is love. That, uh, some people may be born with that, but most people <laughs> taking the spiritual life, uh, if there's something tangible, this is, this is why the whole Hindu tradition uh, gives us so many different uh, Puranic stories and, and uh, what we read in Ramayana and Mahabharata, different, different incidents, different ways, the, the Bhagavata Purana with, with Sri Krishna, to picture God, picture God in a lovable form. If we're very maternal in nature, we picture God as a baby Krishna. That way we can love, we can love God the way that a mother loves a child, because we know that. We know that the love that a mother has for a child, and that simply has to be transferred. We know how much joy we had from our friends when we were, when we were young. Huh? When we're 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, how we love our friends. And just want to stay with them and play with them and everything. So we're told you want to love God, picture God as a friend, and try to develop love that way. Otherwise, if we just say God is infinite, absolute reality, uh, how do we love that infinite, absolute reality or our very own self? Okay, that's good, my very own self. What does it mean to love myself? I'm not talking about my personality. I'm talking about that, that witnessing consciousness. It's not really very easy to, to think. How do we do it? So it's an interesting question, a good question. And remember that the Brahmos had come. So perhaps this is, this is a Brahmo devotee who doesn't like to think of God with form. And even the attributes of God will be very vague things. Yes, God is all love, God is all compassion, God is all mercy. It's not a personality type thing. We fall in love with the personality. So it's a good question. Uh, the Master, repeat his name. So again, a very simple thing. Repeat his name and sins will disappear. Thus you will destroy lust, anger, the desire for creature comfort, and so on. <laughs> Okay, now, devotee is saying, okay, I'm asking you how to love God, and then you say, repeat his name. Now, I have to ask, well, uh, what good will that do, and, and uh, how do I learn to even enjoy repeating the name of God? Namiruchi. How do I get the taste for the name of God? You say, repeat the name of God. Uh, we read about uh, Dr. Shorkar at one time. Yes, he gets a little fed up with the conversa conversation. They're talking about repeating Rama or something. He says, why not repeat Sandesh, Sandesh, Sandesh? For if, if we have no love, then just repeating the name, what good will it do? So the devotee says, how can I take delight in God's name? Master, pray to God with a yearning heart that you may take delight in his name. We pray for that. O oh Lord, please give me a taste for your name. And we have to do it over and over again. One of the, one of the most beautiful and uh, really, really subtle teachings of the Gita is that the highest type of happiness uh, won't be appealing to us when we first taste it. Sri Krishna goes so far as to say that it may taste like poison to us in the beginning. But... If we, if we keep at it, we keep doing it, we keep trying it, we keep tasting it, we start to develop a little taste for it, and at the end, it tastes like amrita, it tastes like nectar. So this is, this is one of the distinguishing characteristics of sattvic happiness, that in the beginning, we may not get much joy out of it. We may do it mechanically, just repeating the name. But through... If we do it with some sincerity and with prayer and, and uh, with a little, whatever little devotion we have, this taste will come. Taste for the name of God. 
Pray to God with the yearning heart that you may take delight in his name. He will certainly fulfill your heart's desire. So saying, the master sang a song in his sweet voice, pleading with the Divine Mother to show her grace to suffering men. Takwa's voice. Huh? We wonder what his voice sounded like. I remember reading that uh, M said that he had never heard such a sweet voice as Takwa's voice. And uh, this, I talk about our Swami Parmeshananji quite a bit. He was a great disciple of Holy Mother and he wrote so many songs. He also had a beautiful voice. He, and uh, Paramesh Maharaj was very close to M. So M said that uh, his was the second sweetest voice that he had heard. And then he had Swamiji also. Swamiji had a, probably from what we hear a deeper voice, a baritone type of voice. Uh, but Takwar must have had a beautiful voice, very sweet voice. And Holy Mother she would sing very softly because she was so shy, but they say she also had a beautiful voice. Would be nice, huh, if we had recordings of Takwar singing or Holy Mother singing Swamiji. So saying the Master sang a song in his sweet voice, pleading with the Divine Mother to show her grace to suffering men. O oh Mother, I have no one else to blame. Alas, I sink in the well these very hands have dug. We create our own problems. Huh? With the six passions for my spade, I dug a pit in the sacred land of earth, and now the dark water of death gushes forth. How can I save myself, O oh my Redeemer? Surely I have been my own enemy. How can I now ward off this dark water of death? Behold, the waters rise to my chest, how can I save myself? O oh, Mother, save me. Thou art my only refuge. With thy protecting glance, take me across to the other shore of the world. Then the Master continues. He's saying again, What a delirious fever is this that I suffer from, O oh, Mother. Thy grace is my only cure. False pride is the fever that racks my wasted form. I and mine are my cry. Oh, what a wicked delusion. My quenchless thirst for wealth and friends is never ceasing. How then shall I sustain my life? Talk about things unreal, that is my wretched delirium, and I indulge in it always, O giver of all good fortune. My eyes in seeming sleep are closed, my stomach is filled with the vile worms of cruelty. Alas, I wander about absorbed in unmeaning deeds. Even for thy holy name I have no taste, O Mother. This is what triggered the song in Takwa's mind, probably. Even for thy holy name I have no taste, O Mother. I doubt that I shall ever be cured of this malady. This is, Takwa is saying, the type of disease. That there are certain types of illnesses. It's COVID-19, huh? This is, this is one of the symptoms that many people get. They lose taste. The, the taste buds don't function. They lose their taste for food. Uh, not just their appetite, but it doesn't taste good. They, they, they won't be able to tell if something is well cooked or bad or sweet or anything. So it's a type of malady, a type of disease. Uh, the devotee will say that. Other people won't care. I have no taste for the name of God, so what? I have better things to do. But the devotee who wants to feel that, to feel the joy of repeating the name of God. This is a sign of devotion to pray. Uh, this longing, longing for devotion is a sign of devotion. Huh? Longing for uh, the ability to enjoy the taste of the name of God is a sign of devotion. This is also a part of that yearning. Not simply yearning for God realization and God vision, but yearning to be able to uh, have that desire if we don't have the desire for God realization, we can pray for the desire for God realization or the desire for, for bhakti and prema. Then the Master said, Even for thy holy name I have no taste. A typhoid patient has very little chance of recovery if he loses all taste for food. But his life need not be despaired if he enjoys food even a little. That is why one should cultivate a taste for God's name. How do we do it? We repeat it. Not only do we repeat it, but whatever name we repeat, 
We try to, to think about the personality behind it. We try to read about it. We repeat the name of Krishna, we read the Bhagavata, we read about all the incidents, we repeat the name, we picture this, this Leela with Radha and, and the other gopis. Uh, all of the things will bring tremendous light and joy to the heart. So this, this is uh, a question of practice. We wonder how can something uh, so wonderful as love of God come from dry mechanical practice? We've no other choice. It starts out as dry and mechanical, but it gets sweeter and sweeter as we keep, all, keep uh, continuing with that practice. That is why one should cultivate a taste for God's name. Any name will do. Durga, Krishna, or Shiva. Then, if through the chanting of the name, one's attachment to God grows day by day, and joy fills the soul, one has nothing to fear. So this is another stage. When we develop this Namiruchi, this taste for the name of God, then we've reached more of a kind of a safe plateau. Of course, we have to keep going higher and higher. But we, we go to different levels from which we shouldn't worry about falling back again. Now I've reached this, this stage where uh, I love to do spiritual practice. I love to repeat the name of God. It's a good sign. This is, this is like uh, the woodcutter saying, oh, okay, now I see that there is a sandalwood forest. That doesn't mean I've reached the end of it. I go a little further, there's a silver mine. I go a little further, a gold mine. Then I have to keep going further till I get to the diamond mine. I get to the very end of it. But this is definitely a, a stage, positive stage, and a very good sign of, of progress when we get the taste for the name of God. The delirium will certainly disappear. He's talking about the delirium of a typhoid patient being like the delirium that we have with this deluded by this world bewitching Maya and uh, the lure of, of sense enjoyment and worldly pleasure and name and fame and everything else. The delirium will certainly disappear. The grace of God will certainly descend. As is a man's feeling of love, so is his gain. Jamon bhab temni lab. I, I I understand how difficult it is to translate this term bhav because it has so many different meanings. But uh, I like to think of this as, as is one's attitude, so is one's gain. It, it fits in better. But this love aspect has to be there also. So whatever our spiritual attitude is, if there's love behind it, then we'll, we'll get the benefit of it. So this, this is also an important element. But uh, it refers to almost anything. If uh, if jaman bhav tam nilab, if if our if our attitude is that I'm free already, then we'll get the benefit of that. Even the jnani can say that this is true. Once two friends were going along the street when they saw some people listening to a reading of the Bhagavata. Come, friend, said the one to the other. Let us hear the sacred book. So saying, he went in went in and sat down. The second man peeped in and went away. He entered a house of ill fame. But very soon he felt disgusted with the place. Shame on me, he said to himself. My friend has been listening to the sacred word of Hari and see where I am. But the friend who had been listening to the Bhagavata also became disgusted. What a fool I am, he said. I've been listening to this fellow's blah, blah. And my friend is having a grand time. In course of time, they both died. The messenger of death came for the soul of the one who had listened to the Bhagavata and dragged it off to hell. The messenger of God came for the soul of the one who had been to the house of prostitution and led it up to heaven. Then Takwa says, Verily, the Lord looks into a man's heart and does not judge him by what he does or where he lives. Krishna accepts a devotee's inner feeling of love. Bhava Grahi Janardana, very famous statement. So from this, we can see that it was, it was not exactly what they did, but what was their, their attitude, what was in their heart, what were they feeling at that time. The, the one, uh, he's, he's thinking of his friend and thinking of, of how nice it would be to be listening to spiritual things. The other is thinking of his other friend who's uh, going to have a nice time there. And... Uh, 
uh, the, the gain is more for the one who is uh, in the house of ill fame than it is for the other. So this is why, why Tak was saying that it's not externally what we do. It's, it's the, what's really deep within our heart that makes the difference. In the Karta Bhaja sect, this is a Vaishnava sect that uh, tries to utilize this uh, Madhur Bhava, this uh, love between Radha and Krishna, and very often they'll uh, kind of uh, enact that type of, of Leela with uh, the men and women together. Thakur uh, used to say that this is like entering the, the house through the back door, through the through the paikana, he would say. This is not, uh, he said, yes, you can realize God this way possibly, but it's not a very clean way to go into it. He didn't recommend it very much, but at the same time, if there was anything posi positive in it, that he would accept that. The Karta Bhaja, this, uh, what is the other one? Uh, there were several at that time, and Vaishnav Charan, who was Thakur's very good friend, uh, he was the leader of this Karta Bhaja, and the other one is called, begins with a B, I think. Anyhow, can't think of it now. So Thakur would often talk about some of their teachings in a very positive way, and at the same time, uh, he would never recommend any of his uh, disciples to go there. And yet he went there, just to see, out of curiosity. In the Karta Bhaja sect, the teacher, while giving instruction, says to the disciple, now everything depends on your mind. This is uh, part of a song that uh, the actual term that she uses is montur. Montur is uh, a very clo colloquial way of saying mantra in Bengali. Instead of mantra, mon mantra, montur, and it also means mon tur. So now I've given you the mantra, now everything is up to your mind, montur. So a little play on words. So Thakur is saying that, yes, now it's up to you. I've given you the tools. I've given you the, the seed. Now you have to grow that seed. You have to cultivate it. You have to uh, make sure it grows into a big tree. Now everything depends on your mind. According to this sect, then this is a quote, he who has the right mind finds the right way and accepts the right end. It was through the power of his mind that Hanuman, leapt over the sea, again, Jamal Bhav Tamnilab, because he had that faith, that was his attitude, that tremendous faith, that love, if we want to say, that he was able to have the, the results that he had. I am the servant of Rama. I have repeated the holy name of Rama. Is there anything impossible for me? That was Hanuman's faith. Ignorance lasts as long as one has ego. There can be no liberation so long as the ego remains. O God, thou art the doer and not I. That is knowledge. We'll stop here. This, of course, is a, a very big subject because Takur, he, he plays a trick on us. He says that uh, you can't have God realization as long as the ego is there. And then he says you can't get rid of the ego. But then he gives us a, a way to get out of it, that uh, uh, we need to develop this ripe ego. Anyhow, we'll stop here. This is page 204, and I'll give a closing chant. Om Niranjanam Nityam Anantarupam Bhaktanukam Bhathuta Vikraham Vai Ishavataram Bharamesham Hidyam Tam Ramakrishnam Shirasanamama We bow our heads before Sri Ramakrishna, who was stainless of infinite nature, whose heart melts in sympathy for his devotees, who is an embodiment of the Divine and the Supreme Lord, and ever worthy of our worship. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all.